Artificial intelligence, big data, modern science and the internet are all revealing a fundamental truth. The world is vastly more complex and unpredictable than we've allowed ourselves to see. Now that technology is enabling us to take advantage of all the chaos it's revealing, our understanding of how things happen is changing. And with it, our deepest strategies for predicting, preparing for and managing our world. This affects everything, from how we approach our everyday lives to how we make moral decisions and how we run our businesses. The result is a world no longer focused on limitations, but optimized for possibilities. We welcome the author of the brilliant book, Everyday Chaos, Technology, Complexity, and How We're Thriving in a New World of Possibility, David Weinberger. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show and great news for our audience today. I have a copy of this brilliant book behind me up for grabs. If you just sign up to the Innovation Show .io newsletter, you will be in with a chance to win that copy. David, before we start and go into the content of the book, I chuckled when you referred to yourself in the third person and you said, the author of this book dislikes talking about himself, but a little context may help. And I'd love if you wouldn't mind if the author would share a bit of context about his background and tell us a bit about the magnificent journey you've been on in life. It all began in a small cabin. <laughs> Uh, I think the relevant bits are for the book and probably for this discussion is um, I had an early career as a, I have a PhD in philosophy. I taught philosophy for six years. I went into tech. I, if you ask me what I do, I say I'm a writer and that's by far the best um, descriptor. Um, I've been, I've worked in tech companies since 86 or for them consulting in the rest. Um, and because of my, the reason I mentioned my academic interests, which have, I'm no longer in any sense a uh, competent academic philosopher. So sometimes I wish I were, but I'm definitely not. But it expresses my interest. So um, I have a strong interest in um, how uh, people, including businesses, think about themselves and the world and um, the ideas we can read, especially in the technology that has become pervasive. Um, I've been at, um, affiliated with the Harvard Berkman Klein Center for 17 years or so as a fellow and senior researcher and, and the like. Um, a couple other things, I guess, so that may be relevant. Um, oh, about five years ago, for five years, I was co director of the Harvard Library Innovation Lab. So I've actually worked with and, uh, engineers, or uh, I'm very drawn to technical folks and engineers. and um, much more recently, until about nine months ago, I was a writer in residence at Google AI. Well, you taught me so much, man, in this book of the history of things, various aspects of life, of technology, how we think about it, how it goes right back to ancient times. I really enjoyed the read. Makes me very happy. Yeah, you the end right here. <laughs> Mic drop. Mic drop, we're done. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just remind you because you wrote this book quite a while ago. We'll remind you of different parts, and uh, we'll hopefully bring a narrative together that makes sense for our audience amidst bring order to the chaos to, c from the complexity. But you tell us at the start of the book, in the introduction, machine learning is just one of many tools and strategies that have been increasingly bringing us face to face with the incomprehensible intricacy of the everyday world. But this benefit comes at a price. We need to give up our insistence on always understanding our world and how things happen in it. That really spoke to me because in a world, in innovation, for example, everybody's so preoccupied with measurement and it's not possible when you're dealing with chaos and complexity. I think you'll agree. Obviously, it's possible. The question is how much good does it do? And I'm in favor of measurement. I mean, I'm not, uh, certainly not anti science or anti-data science, um, it's, it's frequently extremely useful, you know, uh, um, and should be used. But we, I think that it, we have tended over the course of Western history, which is the only thing I know anything at all about, um, we have tended to take the success of measurement, um, data and, and science, 
as telling us something that's essentially not true about our place in the world. Um, and machine learning is by giving us a technology that succeeds by um, embracing the overwhelming, overwhelming complexity of measurement that's now available to us, um, a complexity of data that presumably represents one way or another uh, the complexity of the world. In fact, it's a small slice of the complexity of the world uh, because machine learning as a technology is letting us take advantage of um, that complexity itself. I think we are now getting way more comfortable with the idea that while it is certainly the case that there are general laws and principles that science among other disciplines, but importantly science discovers and which are real and which we would be idiots to ignore, and in the United States, we seem to have a lot of idiots who <laughs> do want to ignore science. Um, while all of that's true, um, those laws do not give us the sort of certainty and calm order that we have thought that they do. They're a really important part of the story, but they're not all of the story. Um, the rest of the story, well, I'll, I'll just sort of jump right into one point if that's okay. Um, so we have the simplest, the best example are Newtonian laws of, of movement and you know, gravity. And, and I am not gonna argue with Newton. I mean, uh, those laws are good, <laughs> really solid laws. Um, nevertheless, and so we think, okay, so here's how the world works. The, the world is obviously big and complex. We know that. Uh, we've always known it. That's always been the starting point. But it turns out, ever, at least ever since the ancient Greeks, that we have thought that there's an order underneath it. It's it's a, not a, what's apparent to us is the chaotic accidents and things flying around and swirls of dust and death coming unasked and unexpected. But underneath it, there's some type of order. And that order is, and this is the big, big, big leap, that order is simple enough for humans to understand it. We are the rational animals. And that wouldn't make sense if the universe wasn't rational in some sense. Uh, there's an order. It, the human mind happens, for whatever reason, uh, to be the instrument that's capable of seeing that order. And that order, obviously, is simply enough for. So we can understand Newton's laws. Obviously, we can. And we can apply them. And that's, that's all amazing. It's incredible. But we have shorted the side of it that says this. Okay, so Newton, we know, thanks to Newton, if you drop a coin from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it's, we know how long it's going to take to hit. If you know the height, you know the mass of the coin in the earth, uh, let's say even the air pressure, if you want to be precise, you can measure that. Perfectly true. No argument. Um, and so the world looks completely knowable, um, and these laws do their, their job. These are generalizations, they're rules, laws, principles. Um, but it, it turns out, um, that we only can get approximations. The approximations are extremely useful. Nothing wrong with an approximation, but when you go to apply the law, um, it depends upon how exact you want the measurement of the coin to be. Do you want to count the oil from Galileo's fingers? I mean, that adds to the mass. Not, not enough that we would ever actually care about it, but it does affect it. Um, if the earth is undulating, the tectonic plates moving very slowly, it, you know, who cares? But that does affect the, the time. Um, the air pressure changes from top to bottom. If a pigeon flies near to it, that sets off a turbulence that might that does affect. And even as certainly Newton knew, the pull of every star in the universe, gravity diminishes to the point where we don't care about it, but it's still there. And so the pull of all of the stars, everything in the universe is affecting the drop of that coin. And so in order to get a really accurate reading, we would have to factor in everything about the state of the universe during that duration, which we cannot possibly do. It doesn't matter because we don't need that sort of accuracy. But that means that every measurement and every application of the principle is approximate because of the tremendous complex. Everything affects everything all the time, everywhere in the universe. And we've known, at least known that since Newton, but we generally have, have known that. And so we look at the laws, which happen to be human comprehensible, which is not by accident one way or another. And we say, okay, so now we understand the world. We, under, we can make predictions. We are the rational animals, all of which is true. But we do so by willfully ignoring 
the tremendous turbulence and chaotic of the universe, that it is not really susceptible to the sort of accuracy that we think that we are getting when we measure things. We get enough accuracy, but we're not getting, we're only getting enough for us, for our purposes. It's a purpose-driven truth. It's not the real truth. So we, we haven't had to worry about that because we can get things, generally get things accurate enough. Um, and we tune our projects to the degree of accuracy that we can get, right? Um, so we have a sort of reinforcing system. We, we get accurate and we're tremendously successful and self-destructive species. We've that part aside for now. <laughs> oh, I laugh at the end of the, of the world. <laughs> uh, we get what we need, but we also give ourselves a picture that is essentially false of the universe. It's a weird thing about machine learning. Can I keep on going? Please. Do you want to get a word in edgewise? No, uh, go for okay. it, man. One of the weirdest things about machine learning, if not the weirdest, is that, yeah, you give it data and it programs itself based on what it learns from the data. And what it learns from the data are statistical correlations among buckets of numbers and has no ideas, idea what those numbers represent or what the relationships are. And that's the really surprising part. So if you wanted to write a program to um, predict health, the way in the old days, the way that non-machine learning, um, you, the way you would do it is you would figure out what are the factors that affect health or the particular thing you're interested in. And you'd write a program that takes in metrics, measurements, data about those, uh, those factors. And then you've also told it what the relationships are among the pieces that we understand. So we think smoking has an effect on uh, but what is that effect? And so we program in what we think that effect is. And we think that uh, Mediterranean diet has some type of effect and we program in those relationships. Um, then when you have a new patient, you put in the data and out comes uh, prediction. And in this case, it doesn't work very well because it's, it's way too complex, um, but it works fine if you're doing a spreadsheet, which is a program essentially for a business where you know what the factors are and you program them in revenues, number of salespeople, cost of support, taxes, and all the rest of it, and the relationships among them. That the sales force costs money, but it generates revenue and revenue affects taxes. And all this is, it's a model of your business or it's a model of the human body. Um, and you program that in and, you know, again, programming, we know this works to the degree that that we find it helpful to a degree that we find helpful machine learning you take the data but you don't tell it what we already know about the relationship so it seems crazy it seems why we're keeping that information out um and the reason to do that is i think primarily empirical um there is a semi-distinct start to machine learning it has a long history you can take it back into the 60s easily and sometimes before but generally you want to talk about the rise of modern machine learning you look at i think it was 2011 competition that was held uh, every year um, where programs would compete to see who would do best at identifying a set of images this is a zebra and that's a cup and, and the like and so the traditional way of doing it, where it was getting you know fairly successful, was you taught the uh, computer, you told the computer, if you see black and white vertical stripes, it's probably a zebra. If it's a big mass of gray, then that's one of the signs of being an elephant. If it has a sort of what we would call tusks, when you describe in terms of the pixels, as it's ivory colored pixels that come to a point, then that adds to the possibility that it's, a, that it's an elephant, et cetera. You give it those rules. And it works you know, fairly well. But the winner of it in 2011, possibly 2012, because I never get a fact straight if I can avoid it, uh, was a team that said, you know, let's just let's not try to tell it these things. We know what correlate what the correlations are between photos and elephants, big mass of gray with pointy tusks and zebras and and their images. Let's not tell it that at all. Let's just give it images and we'll tell it. OK, you're looking at an image. We're going to label this one elephant. Here's another one labeled elephant. Here's one labeled zebra. We're not going to tell you anything at all about the relation. We're not going to tell you elephants are gray. We know that. That's a generalization. We're not going to tell you the simplest, most predictable things we know. Just look at the damn images and figure out the statistical correlations among them. Let's see what happens. And what happens is, is that they beat the old style of programming where we try to tell the machine what we know. And so that's how machine, roughly how machine learning works. You give it the data, you put it into labeled buckets. This is one particular, maybe the main type of machine learning that people think about. Um, you, you give it the labels for the buckets. Um, I'm sorry, you have the labels for the things. If it's health records, 
you would give it, uh, in one case, 500 different data types on each record. You give it 700,000 records. You give it those buckets of data. You don't tell it that, oh, these numbers are, are the person's weight and these numbers represent the person's gender or whatever. Uh, you just give it numbers and not the relation. These, these are symptoms. These are medicines. These are outcomes. Nothing, nothing. You don't tell it any of that. It looks for correlations. Many of the correlations are spurious. We hope that they get outweighed by the ones that are more meaningful or real. It does a very uh, complicated statistical analysis of those correlations and how those correlations cor correlate. And it, if it works, you can feed in a new health record and it will outcome the out output uh, what it has learned from those correlations, such as uh, so, you know, 63 percent chance that this person is going to come down with type two diabetes, or you better check for better check for breast cancer, or et cetera, et cetera. Those so those correlations, those predictions are made with. They're not based upon what we know. They're not based upon generalizations, laws, principles, anything else, even down to the level of, oh, medicines affect disease. Not even that, much less smoking causes cancer, which it does, by the way. It, it's looking at so many correlations, sometimes that are so complex in their interrelationships um, that we can't... Uh, Computer scientists talk about this in terms of, of dimensions. Then there can be tens of thousands of dimensions. We're pretty much stuck at three or four in how we can think about things that we simply can't figure out how it's making its prediction. But empirically, we discover that you know, it says 65% chance of diabetes. And yeah, turns out that it's pretty accurate on that. It is a complete inversion of just about everything that we know. This is a complete not complete. I'll say, in per for rhetorical purposes, I'll say it is a com complete embrace of particulars, the sorts of particulars that our principle based sciences, which we need to continue to fund, and you know, they're really important. These don't, do not replace science, uh, but it, it is, let's say, a complement to our idea that to know something is to know the generalization under which it falls, thus ignoring what's particular about the particular. Machine learning cares about what's particular and different about the particulars. That's where its analysis occurs, which means it can be highly resist resistant to human understanding, which looks for generalizations, principles, laws, rules, and the like. I got this that, that we try to put parameters on things or restrictions on things rather than letting them happen uh, as they do happen. And so you, you mapped back to Newtonian laws but also then you remind us of chaos theory and it's the reason by the way i tried to wear a pin that reflects the show and i, I put a butterfly uh, that's why i picked a butterfly today because you tell us chaos theory prepared the ground for the disruption of settled ideas about how change happened and i'd love if you'd gave our listeners a background to chaos theory because you went deep into this but i'd love if you'd share this I realize everything I just said is incredibly abstract and we should probably talk about it. I'm sure we will uh, about some of the, what, why this matters to somebody who, you know, isn't a ex uh, philosophy teacher. Um, okay. So uh, I am not a mathematician. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a writer. Right. So it's, uh, so I'm going to give you a non-mathematical understanding of chaos theory, which is going to drive the actual mathematicians nuts as it should. <laughs> so they don't theory, listen, man. They don't listen to the show anyway. Well, they won't <laughs> anymore. That's for sure. Um, chaos theory came to prominence, well, the sort of public notice in the early 70s. Um, and much of uh, my book, Everyday Chaos, is actually about how the life on the internet has subtly, subtly gotten us to embrace chaos theory without even knowing that we're doing it, because it's a pretty good embodiment of chaos theory of the sort of chaos chaos theory is thinking about. So chaos theory is not about rioting in the streets and there's really negative sorts of chaos that spring to mind because that stuff generally is quite bad. Um, so chaos theory says a few things about the world. Um, it points out a few things. Um, one is that there's a lot of stuff um, and it uh, affects, everything affects everything. Um, another is that many, um, many effects are nonlinear. So you can know a rule 
that works very well. Um, but a um, that rule may work only up to a point, and then the nature of the rule changes. And we we have experience of this in real life and um, in lots of places, but especially on on the internet, where scale will suddenly flip something. Um, and I'll I'll give an example. The standard sorts of examples are. Uh, heating up of water in a tube in which steam reaches a certain point at which point the behavior in the tube varies. More practical sort of example, which will drive the mathematicians nuts, um, is uh, how things go viral on the internet. Um, so um, if you remember the ice bucket challenge from five yeah. years ago, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ridiculous, right? Uh, yet it raised like $150 million for a really great cause, which is having an effect. So, but it's, if for those of <laughs> listeners who, who don't remember the ice bucket challenge, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, it was, <laughs> um, the idea was that you pour a bucket of ice water over your head, video it, and then challenge, call out somebody else and say, Aiden, I challenge you to take the ice bucket challenge. And you would make a donation to the uh, ALS fund, I think it was. Raised a ton of money and went crazy. Over the course of a few weeks, it seemed like everybody was doing it. Obama did it. I mean, it was when he was president, right? The president of the United States did the ice bucket challenge. Nuts. Um, and I've been a marketing guy for a long time. Um, and so I'm really confident that as a result of that, CEOs went to their marketing VPs because they had heard about the ice bucket challenge. Um, they said, we need one of those. Get me one of those. <laughs> yeah. They, they, you see how many people have watched these videos? It's billions. Get me one of those. And the marketing person with a sense of increasing depression either says, okay, boss, we'll try, knowing that it's impossible, or tries to explain to the boss, it's not how it works. You know what a viral video is, boss? It's something that for no apparent reason, that's the important part, for no apparent reason starts to, starts to spread. Um, it's not predictable. We don't know what makes things viral. I mean, there may be hints around and there's people give advice, but if we knew what made things viral, everybody would be making everything viral. Every CEO wants this. It's like coming to us and saying, you know, the great I Heart New York logo or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We need one of those. Yeah, sure. But there's a, there's a reason why I can only think of two examples of them because they're hugely exceptional. And do you think they knew at the time that these things would become iconic? No, they probably thought they were pretty good, but who, that's how it works. It's um, viral, uh, which means it's unpredictable. And once it's, it has no power until somehow at some tipping point, it goes nonlinear. That is, it goes from, oh, let, the numbers are going up, oh, 10 people, 100 people, uh, 500, 1,000, 2 million. That's a nonlinear effect. And we're very used to it on the internet. Social networks are examples of this as well, where if they actually don't work. If you have 100 people, you suddenly need to have a million, 100 million, 2 billion people. Um, so we're very used to this sort of thing on the internet. And two other uh, really important things, one of which is closely related, it is the butterfly effect as on your, uh, as it's known and as on your lapel, uh, which was the title of the paper that sort of kicked off the entire chaos theory, awareness of the chaos theory. Um, it was something I always get it wrong because it's like a fact, but could a butterfly alighting in on a flower in Argentine, Argent, Argentina cause a tornado in Topeka? And the answer is, yeah, well, yeah. And the reason it usually doesn't, this is another very nonlinear thing. Um, and my way of explaining this, which I'm not sure is right, is that um, there's a lot of potential energy in a system. And you can't create new energy, right? That's just really basic physics, right? So there's, but there's a lot of potential energy in a system, such as the internet. And a very small cause can suddenly um, have a cascading effect like a, uh, a single rock that causes an av avalanche that lets loose all of this energy. Um, that's what the uh, butterfly does, but it's not a very much not a direct line. The point is so many things are connected that you could not possibly predict 
this big outcome of this little event. Um, and the last thing is that uh, chaotic systems, in this sense, are very susceptible. It matters a lot what the starting conditions are um, because you have everything in, in a state at one moment. And because everything is connected, where it goes next is dependent upon that state. And the internet a sort of analogy to this, I'm not, it may, I'm not sure what to call it, but if you try to wake up in the morning, you know, check in on the internet, as I suspect we all do, whatever our routine is, check the news, your Twitters, your emails, whatever. Um, wake up in the morning and try to predict where are you going to be on the internet that day? Wake up in the morning and look, look at the initial state, right? Check your, your stuff as you do every morning and then try to write down where, where you will have been in that day. What sites will you have visited or even what topics you're going to be talking, uh, going to be looking up. You can't do it. And likewise, if you go at the end of the day, you look at your browser history, trying to figure out how you got those places is, can be as hard as trying to remember how a conversation, an interesting conversation. How did we end up talking about butterflies? What are we talking about? The internet a minute ago. Um, and that's, that's how the internet works. That's what it means to be susceptible to initial conditions and my understanding of it. It's also how life works. Because everything I just said about the internet is true of you stepping out of the house in the morning if you are in a place where it is possible to step out of your house at this point. Fortunately, we are. You know, we have no idea. That is the common state of life. And having that be a revelation of chaos theory and be argued seems to me just indicates the extent to which we have been locked into this idea that we make plans, we can predict, we control, it's all governed by laws we can understand, uh, which is only true to a small extent. Far more of life are, consists of accidents and unpredictable things based upon the world the chaos theory describes. Beautiful. And you mentioned then not long after chaos theory started taking shape, a related phenomenon became an object of study, which was com complex adaptive systems. And some of the ground for this, for the public's appreciation of this came from the brilliant book, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson in 1962. That brought public awareness to the delicacy of intertwined ecosystems. And what I wanted you to share here, I'd love you to share, is that that, co that term ecosystems was only coined in 1935 but it's now everything. Everything is ecosystems, all intertwined. So more chaos than ever before. More recognition of, of the chaos in the chaos, in the chaos theory sense, because the other part of this is everything's connected. So yeah, I mean, ecosystems has a slightly long history, uh, like 80 years, but it was only with Rachel Carson uh, in the late 50s um, that people... I, I was alive then, and I sort of remember people's heads getting screwed around backwards, think, thinking, wait, you're telling me that T uh, the TNT, that, um, oh, what's the pesticide? I think it's, uh, is this, oh, I know this stuff you're talking about. The DDT? DDT. DDT? DDT. Is that it, or is that another? I think, so. I think so, man. I think so. I have memories of running as a youngster on in tract housing on Long Island merrily running with my little friends through the cloud of DDT being emitted by the the bug spraying town bug spraying truck but it hasn't affected me at all I don't think <laughs> uh, it explains everything that was how benign <laughs> we thought this was and so when Carson publicized the fact maybe this was slightly after her the um, when it turned out that uh, pesticides were killing the condors, California condors, and probably everything I just said, every fact is wrong, but the basic, uh, the specifics are, are wrong, but the facts is, I think, approximately correct. There was public concern, but it was mainly shock and disbelief that, um, that spraying insecticides could kill a bird. And it was indirect. It was softening the shells of the condors, right? It wasn't like they were condors were inhaling and coughing out, you know, it was an indirect chain. It was a butterfly effect, right? And an indirect chain. And that was, it began just really to hit people that, uh, first of all, the, in some sense, the beauty of it, but also the terror of it, because who knows what else we're doing benignly that will turn out to destroy the planet. Well, we've pretty well found out much of that now. 
But that ecosystem thinking was revelatory and uh, world changing, at least in the West, how we think about how the world goes together. It was exactly it's little causes setting off chains. Everything's connected. Oh, great. But oh, holy bad word. It may kill us too. Um, and that has become now, of course, it's totally commonplace as a way of thinking. It's the framework for much of our thought, which is great. And the internet, which is fundamentally a linked environment, right? That's what that's there's no other characteristic of the internet that is as fundamental as that, I think. Um, living on that for a generation now, it's been 25 years since the web started to take off, um, puts us in an environment where not only are the links, uh, the link nature of it visible, but it is the big benefit. It's the thing that brings us the most uh, value from the internet and pleasure. Um, and so the, we get pleasure now from the surprise, the novelty, the unpredictability of the internet. And this, I, I don't think that we have begun yet as a culture to cope with the fact that this is now how we think and certainly how the, the younger generation, the kids today think, how they were brought up. Perhaps we could share briefly some early cultures and how they understood prediction. Because the, you talk about the history of prediction and how it goes back to the past. Let, let's look at that first. And then we might look at, for example, linear time versus cyclical time. I think the important point is that our, I, the, I, our casual idea of prediction is actually really new. It's, uh, say, hundreds of years old, not thousands of years old. Now, that doesn't mean that um, the, it, certainly, say, the ancient Egyptians were able to look ahead and to see and to know that the flooding of the Nile banks was going to happen soon. But it's not exactly what we would think of as a prediction, because they were cyclical. They had a cyclical view of time, because for thousands of years, this was dynasties lasted. That that culture lasted for thousands of years. We're not used to that, right? But it, it did, and it uh, existed to a large degree without major changes. And I know almost nothing about it. So all of the Egyptologists uh, in the in your are going to be <laughs> writing angry letters, letters. Yes, they're going to be putting them in the postal. <laughs> yeah, messenger pigeons. Um, it was a cyclical environment. The in physical environment was pretty predictable. You knew that when the dog star was visible, that three weeks later or whatever it was, the banks of the Nile would overflow, and you begin the agricultural cycle and so forth. Um, and so it was, in some sense, it was looking ahead and certainty about the future, but there wasn't enough unpredictability for our sense of prediction to make sense. Um, for that, you need, and likewise, the ancient Greeks had, um, they would make the same sort of predictions about uh, the sun's going to go down or the um, weather's going to be this or that, um, as, as we, in a sense, as we do. Um, but they had a, there was a pretty big gap for them between the certainty of destiny, which is settled by the fates, um, with, um, the gods having only a little bit of control within that. And certainly not over the major events that the you know, fates are predicting birth, death, marriage, and the like. And that was just, that was it. That never varied. And, you know, as uh, I'm sure you know, a lot of Greek literature is about the inevitability of you can't outrun fate. Um, and then you had a crazy ass, like, like bad human gods, uh, as unpredictable and subject to bad decisions as humans, but, you know, with a lot more power. Um, and you had a sort of subclass of demons that would, and then you had just accidents, you know, a, a turtle drops on a playwright's head and suddenly he's dead. Um, and there's, you know, that was his fate, but so you had this big melange and not a lot of room for what we think of as prediction, um, in medieval times and also for the Greeks, um, you could read auguries and omens because there was, there was a connection of everything to everything. Um, and there was stuff that was going to happen. 
And you could get a sense of it by, but that's again, not exactly our sense of prediction. Our sense of prediction, um, which we take for granted is, there's some set of laws that are controlling the behavior of the universe, physical laws and mainly physical laws, but others. Um, we can know them, which is amazing. Um, and the future is just sort of, I'll say chaotic enough that we are we need to make predictions based on these laws and we can make predictions based on these laws. So um, one of the ways that this, this shows up is in the concept of strategy, which is a very modern idea. It's, our idea of strategy is not the Greek idea of strategy, even though it goes back to the Greek world, word. Um, it, 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 it's, we should measure it in like two, it's a couple centuries old. It was only um, in the 19th century that we started to get um, strategies of war because war was the most chaotic of events, right? I mean, of all the things, that's go figure. But we began to think under the sway of the Enlightenment and Newton's success in, in, in science to think, well, no, there's, hey, we can find some laws, principles, generalizations about warfare as well. And because of that, we can apply those laws to the you know, ever-changing conditions and make some reasonable predictions. And that will be our, they, those laws, therefore, or principles become strategy. You know, so things, uh, things like uh, if you're being attacked, move to the center or move to the sides or whatever it is. Um, and so we got, we got uh, volumes of the strategy of war, which was again, sort of what? The most chaotic of events, human events, and we can now have strategies, cool. And they were applied and they had some success with it. It's really only in the 1960s that businesses started to say, oh, we should uh, further militarize ourselves and we should start adopting strategies. Um, and almost as soon as we started adopting strategies for business, there was pushback against strategies. Um, and there was increasing, increasing pushback. Now, it's, it's I think um, some of the biggest bestsellers are saying strategy, basically strategy is overrated. Uh, or it's dangerous to rely only on strategy. The Black Swan book points out the most obvious thing in the world, but needed to be pointed out, which itself tells you something, which is, oh, things can go really wrong and you won't know about it and can't predict it and you better prepare for it, right? Uh, your supplier's uh, warehouse burns down. Whoops, you know, there goes your strategy. Um, and, uh, oh God, I always forget names. Is it a transient advantage to Rita McGrath? Yes, it is exactly that. Yeah, she, she's a guest on the show. So I, oh, yeah, actually, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and she's fantastic. All right. It's look for small opportunities or look for risks and advantages in the smallest of signals. For me, the, and so prediction has changed its, its nature. Um, we are now, we can use machine learning to make better predictions than we could before in many areas, which is why we use it. For example, ah, sorry, my chair is creaking. I'm gonna <laughs> it's not my back. It's, it's a chair. butterfly landing on it, man, and just uh, <laughs> yeah. edging you off. So we use uh, machine learning for weather forecasts, right? I, mean, I think fairly non-controversially, although there are issues uh, because the data is unevenly spread. We're, we have much more data for developed richer areas of the world. So even weather forecasts express some degree of inequity. In any case, we use weather forecasts, uh, machine learning for weather forecasts, because they work better. And notice the past 10 years, weather forecasts, in I think everybody's experience, have gotten better, more accurate and looking further out, thanks to machine learning. But it's able to do this not by applying the laws of weather the way you would if it were uh, the old way of doing weather forecasting and not by sort of thinking that there are strategies for weather or whatever. You do it by giving it just tons and tons of, of let's say, chaotic data, data that is just numbers and looking for those complex relationships. And it turns out that works better than trying to apply the seven Newtonian principles that kick weather forecasting off initially in the very early 1900s. Yeah, I, I, I loved when you talked about weather forecasts before and after before and, and also here, how you talked about, and I think this is really important, how Newtonian laws shaped our own personal mental models, how we see the world, because 
that has really restricted so many of us. And uh, it tees us up nicely to share how a Newtonian how Newtonian view of the world shapes those m mental models because you say here, Newtonian predictions reveal the universe as a self-contained clockwork that can be explained purely on its own terms. I'd love if you had to go down a rabbit hole on that one. Sure. Um, so uh, Newton's big book, the revolutionary book came out in the late 1600s. Um, like 1690. Um, mechanical watches and clocks were already uh, objects of fascination, but um, they became the standard metaphor for how the universe works. Um, where Because they operate according to very simple principles, like gears, pushing other gears, um, and a spring unwinding or pendulum, excuse me, for force, um, and they are completely understandable. Any human being can open up a watch and you look closely enough to say, oh yeah, no, I see what's happening. That, that one's turning that one, that one's turning that one, that's a second hand, right? They're completely explicable. Um, and so it seemed like that was, that was how the universe worked, right? There's a handful of laws and it is way, obviously way more complex than a single clockwork, um, but it's completely explicable to humans if we look carefully enough because fundamentally it's that simple. Many more gears, but the principles are the same. Newton himself was not very happy with the clockwork metaphor because he was, he was very religious and he was correctly afraid that a clockwork metaphor for the universe leaves no room for God. God makes the clockwork and then leaves, right? You don't, uh, and he did not want a universe. He did not believe in a universe in which God was absent. Um, there's a, <laughs> I came across this. Um, Newton apparently at one point toyed with the idea. I think this was in the letter. He didn't publish this as part of, uh, um, didn't publish it. Uh, that maybe comets, which were also a really interesting phenomenon because they seem to be outside of the clockwork, right? As planets revolve around the sun and like gears and elliptical gears or something, but this comets just showed up and go away and they come back. We, we don't even know if they come back. At that point, that was a, a hypothesis from Newton's closest friend, insofar as he had any friends, um, Halley, Halley, of the, of the comet fame. Anyway, so Newton had this idea that that he toyed with that maybe, maybe um, comets were thrown by God as a direct intervention because the beautiful clockwork with the orbits going around, those planets are going to come out of, they're going to gradually, very slowly sort of shift out of place. And a comet would come by thrown perfectly by God in order to nudge them through their gravitational force back into perfect orbits. So there would be, so we, we do need God. But anyway, so he, he didn't like clockwork metaphor for that reason, but it is, um, was surprisingly, well, unsurprisingly apt and, and stuck. Um, our metaphor has been changing. Um, so one of the assumptions of the book, explicit assumptions of my book, um, which is by far not an original assumption, um, is that our, um, our, our understanding of our dominant technology tends to shape our understanding of everything else, including our, it shapes our own experience. So when you're living in a clockwork universe, things seem like that everything's clockwork. And if something's not right, then you should adjust the clockwork. And you start to pay people for piecework in, in factories as if they were parts of a relatively complex clockwork that's called a factory. Um, and you have time and motion studies. I mean, it's all, it's very clockwork. Uh, one of the famous examples of a change in this is um, Freud. And I am not sure this is true, but I would choose, I would like to believe that it is that uh, when Freud was in a formative stage, they were redoing the sewers and steamworks in Vienna where he grew up. Um, and this is why in Freudian psychology and to this very day, we talk about being under pressure uh, because it's basically a steam engine uh, metaphor. And we are, we have to let off steam when we're, you know, we feel this pressure, we have to let off steam. Um, so our technology, I think, uh, not alone in this 
uh, affects our understanding. Marshall McLuhan, famous advocate of this in um, one way or another. And I think that uh, computers clearly have, we've reformulated almost all of life as, an, as information ever since computers became dominant in the early 1950s. Technology is advancing so quickly. I think that machine learning is now having the same sort of effect. So we're going from sort of clockworks where everything's perfectly predictable. So long as you know enough and everything's manageable, controllable, and understandable um, through a couple other stages to an internet where it's about links that extend far beyond our capacity that are always surprising us that, that are the source of much of the value. That's very uncontrolled nature of, of the internet where things scale by not being managed, right? Nobody, there was no manager for the internet, no, nobody who was in charge of creating it. And if there had been, it would never have scaled. So we've gotten used to the benefits of uncontrolled scale and thus uncontrolled life to now machine learning, which is, I think, impressing upon us the unknowability of the world because we can't understand these things, make better predictions than we have, but do so in ways that we can't always understand and do so on the basis. They don't start with general machine learning systems, don't start with generalizations. We don't give them generalizations or laws. They generally, so to speak, don't produce generalizations or laws, but they produce more accurate predictions than we're able, which is enculturating us to understand our world as consisting of so many little tiny pieces that nevertheless, in which we can nevertheless uh, sense patterns with technology that exceeds our capacity. I love that. And you mentioned Marshall McLuhan and this, there's a quote mistakenly often attributed to him. First, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. I think it's, I, I think it was a, a take on Churchill said that about our cities or some, our buildings. I can never remember the guy's name um, who said exactly almost exactly that, but I've also heard it attributed to Churchill. In any case, uh, uh, congratulations on being like the only person I've ever heard not attribute it to McLuhan. <laughs> you were like, he's walking into the trap, don't do it. Anyway, you know, you, the concept of that really stuck with me because I thought about how we also get stuck in our mindset. So when we have a way of doing something, we suffer from functional fixedness. You know, that's what that's what a chair is to an adult versus a child looks at a chair and goes, it can be a rocket ship or a hut or a den and I throw a blanket over, etc. But I, I wanted to bring that back to the start of the internet, the start of computers, essentially, for, in the 1950s. So, so let's take the 1950s as the start. It was the age of computers, let's call it that. Because, because we had a Newtonian view of the world, we further cemented that Newtonian world we impressed it upon the world of computers. And we started to create trying to try to create predictable, controllable machines. I'd love if you'd bring us here and then and then we'll kind of backdate that to the idea of where the internet now is with open internet AIs, uh, with open APIs with interoperability, etc. And how that just leads to unbelievable possibility. Oh, another simple question. Just, uh, is it are you ever going to ask me a yes, no question? By the way? No, I never. No, I never do. <laughs> I'm incapable of doing so. I try to keep them open, man. I, I keep them as open as the internet should be. <laughs> okay, so. Um, computers um, combine the belief in a knowable rule set, in this case, logic. Right? And we still we talk about programming logic, and it's completely accurate. Right? It's some set of rules that is coherent and produces good results. Um, so it combines that with the necessary, with a, a needed reduction in information, which is uh, a huge difference between uh, computing and the internet, the sort of age of computing, the age of the internet. Um, and the age of computing was it was famous for its reduction of information. That was where the pushback came from. Um, uh, you know, the beatniks in the 1950s and the hippies in the 1960s, uh, who, uh, and even the British TV show, The Prisoner, in which, can you do a Patrick McGowan imitation? <laughs> not very well, man. Okay, so I'll just do it in, in, <laughs> yeah, please. in, in American. I am not a number, he said in a beautiful British accent. I am not a number. I am a free man. Um, which is sort of the tagline of that show. Um, it was all about, and, and conformity was the, the big issue. Um, one of the big issues. We don't want to be conformist, it, but that's what computers enforced because their capacity was so small. 
starting off with punch cards. I mean, you had to reduce the data to what would fit on a punch card and the number of punch cards what would fit into the limited memory of the early mainframes. Um, and so we started to standardize data um, because we had to. So HR records, you know, human resource records would contain the necessary stuff like your name, address in the US social security number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but only what was needed. So you would not typically put in, uh, how is this person getting to work? What part of town do they live in? What's the nearest bus stop? Because you wouldn't be thinking, oh, this might be useful if we decided to set up carpooling. You wouldn't do that. Or what, what are their hobbies? Because you weren't thinking, oh, this person has an interest in uh, photography. That might turn out to be useful. Who knows? The minimal set of information, because that's all you can manage. And everybody's information was exactly the same, because that's how databases work. That's how these records work. That was enforced to some degree anyway by punch cards in which every physically you had to have a spot for each piece of information, each, each datum. Um, and so we were right. It was correct. The cultural critique was 100% spot on. Um, it, I think it missed uh, what happens when computers got more memory, and more flexibility and how they would help and also hurt. Um, but that, no, that's right. These are about reducing information. Uh, which has been the, the, I don't know, I say one of the original sins of, of humans, at least in the West, that are approached understanding things has always been to reduce it. Because um, we've had to, because our brains are small. And so I'm going to go back to generalizations, principles, rules, and the like, to explain something has been, it still is, and to some extent always will be, to find the general principle which this particular fits under. This is an example of that thing. It's an, an example of a zebra, or it's an example of a, of a, a rainstorm, or an example of, and um, we understand things by applying a general, simple, relatively simple general principle to a particular. Um, that's a way of simplifying, because you can ignore everything except what that principle applies to. I'm sorry, I'm being very abstract. I could give you an example, but I'm not sure. No, please, whatever, whatever way you want to bring it, man. Okay, I do want to get back to computers. So if you are, uh, you're late for an appointment, take a shortcut down a dirt road, back road, and you get a, a flat. You want a, an explanation. Why did I get a flat? So you look at the tire, you find a nail, and you say, ah, okay. That type, and then you can fix it, right? Very useful. I'm not going to argue against that type of explanation. It's a very common one, very useful. It's called a sine qua non, which is what is the one thing that had it not been there, the flat wouldn't have happened. And it's the nail, except it's not the nail because you only ran over the nail because you're taking a shortcut because you were late. So that's also, if you hadn't been late, sine qua non, you wouldn't have gotten the, the flat. And if you you actually had swerved for, you swerved for a rabbit, which is what caused you to call, so if it hadn't swerved or there was no rabbit, the rabbit is also part of the scene of fun on. And also, if um, if cars were tires are not made out of rubber, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. And that's for socioeconomic capitalist reasons that they're made, they're made so they can be punctured. That was a choice. So if capitalism were different, you wouldn't have. And if there were hadn't been gravity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. Everything had to happen. Everything is a scene of fun on because that's how the world works. So the way that we but we don't need to know everything. What we, the, the cause, the explanation of the tire is the thing that we can change. We can't change the past, you know, being late, swerving for the rabbit. We can't change gravity or capitalism. One thing we can change is the nail in the tire. So that becomes the explanation. It's very useful. We should continue doing that, but we might want to recognize that it's not really the explanation. Much, much more happened. We had to reduce, had to throw out everything else in order to get to the thing that we need, which is what can, what can we change? Um, there's thought about what constitutes a cause that goes along the same lines, um, but I will leave that aside. Um, and so Danny Hillis is somebody, to H-I-L-L-I-S, a polymath genius. Uh, you mentioned him in the book. Yeah, that's I right. Do, yeah. 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 Um, okay. So um, we have been, our basic way of knowing things has, overall has been to reduce them, to find the big broad patterns that will allow us to talk about up a level of abstraction where thing, 
things are reduced. In the world of, of corporate decision, decision making, it is 100% the case that corporate hierarchies were invented in the 1860s in order to reduce information going up to the big boss at the top. Um, this is explicit, right? So it, uh, how can one person know enough to be able to make decisions? Well, I'm going to say he, because that's, especially in the 1860s, that was taken for granted. He can't. Um, and so we need a series of managers and lieutenants going up the pyramid um, who will reduce, competently reduce information to what that one person needs. And so there's a strong sense in which corporate hierarchies were designed to throw out information. Okay. Internet comes along, we no longer throw out information. It makes its own problems, of course, but we, we don't throw anything out. And to I'm gonna to point to one of the positives about it. Cause I think it, it is, first of all, it is a gigantic change in how we manage information and, many, and make decisions. Um, and it is a gigantic change in how we think about our responsibilities in the world. So um, it used to be that if you wanted to publish something, a book like your wall full of them, my about to cascade wall full of them, <laughs> it's, I'm in rebellion against gravity. In my yeah, yeah. Newton would not be happy with you, man. No, yeah, he'd, be, he'd be squirming in his chair. <laughs> um, You'd be sending a comment to write my <laughs> yeah, books. throwing uh, that is not W right, but <laughs> um, uh, okay. So if you wanted uh, to publish a book in the old days, and it's still now too, but uh, you'd send it to a publisher. A publisher gets tons of books, filters them ahead of time, publishes the tiny handful that they want. And if you can't find a publisher for it, it's essentially invisible. It's been filtered out. Publishers have to filter. Libraries have to. Much as I love libraries, libraries have to filter. That's one of the things they, they actually do well. I mean, they do many things well, but that's one of, I don't know how to put that better. <laughs> it's good that they filter. Yeah. Uh, but they have to filter because um, they're dealing with, and publishers are dealing with physical objects, and there's just not enough room, and they're expensive to create, et cetera, et cetera. The internet comes along, becomes insanely cheap to uh, publish the post. and so everything gets put up. You write something that gets rejected by every publisher because it's terrible, you'll still post it on, on the net in case somebody wants to find it. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't filter. We do filter on the internet, but we filter, it, it's rather than filtering on the way in, we allow people to filter on the way out. We, this is true overall of the internet. So I put up my terrible novel that everyone rejected, and that's fine. No filter going in, but there's lots of filters. When you go looking for uh, kid, uh, young adult literature, you're going to filter heavily. And I'm going to promise you, my <laughs> novel is not going to show up. My $100 million secret available for free at no yeah. bookstore anywhere. Uh, I'm a little bitter. Um, <laughs> I'm over it. Furthermore, if you are going to make a collection on the internet, Sometimes you want to do it the old way, which is filter on the way in, make sure everything's perfect, high quality. If you're a retailer, very likely you want to do that. If you're eBay, you don't. If you're Amazon, you do much less of it. You may do some filtering for scams. I hope you do it for some scams and the like, but generally those are going to be after the fact too. If you're the Apple store or the Android store, the Google store, you'll do some filtering to one degree or another, but that's up to you. If you are, uh, if you are collecting... Uh, Postcards of your state. You're going to post them all. And if you come across one that maybe, maybe it's your state, maybe it isn't, maybe it's the borderline between the two, maybe whatever, you're very likely to post it because you don't know who's, who might want it. It doesn't really cost you anything to post it. You'll build an inclusive collection and give people tools for filtering on the way out. And that is the most common way in which stuff is put up on the internet now. So we still filter, we just do it on the way out, which means we don't throw out information. We throw out information, we, we've had to do it because of the physical limitations of managing information in written form. Um, we've done it because we've had to do it. We try to do it well, of course, by trying to anticipate what people are going to need. And we're relative, always at least relatively good at that. Sometimes we're great at it, but we're never perfect at it. So you, you would never have known in, I'm going to take a bad example from my youth, the assassination of JFK, of John Kennedy, um, the assassin bought his rifle from Sears Roebuck, you know, gigantic consumer catalog, 
um, in like 1961 or something like that, um, you would never know in 1961 that that piece of information, that obscure product listing in a Sears Roebuck catalog was gonna have historic importance. So you might not have preserved it, right? If you, We don't have room for all of this. Let's just take, let's collect the clo uh, clothing stuff is probably gonna be interesting. Probably not. And, the, and you would have lost that. You cannot tell what people are going to be interested in because interests are not predictable. They're ways the world, they're not things we have, they're ways the world calls to us which is why you can't predict in the beginning of the day where you're gonna end up on the internet. Um, and because history, you didn't know that somebody was gonna kill Kennedy with one of those rifles. We just can't know. And so now that we don't have to throw out information, we tend not to, which means we don't have to pretend we can, can anticipate what people are going to need, want, or be interested in. That changes everything. It opens up so many possibilities. No doors are closed. You're not cut off from this because even wise curators didn't anticipate that X, Y, or Z. Because who would? Who would? This is this changes how we not only how we operate, it changes our most fundamental idea about how we know the world. So different from the computer age where success meant successfully limiting the information. Now we we want we want all the information that we can to be read, readily available through incredibly powerful search techniques that were unimaginable 20 years ago. when I was in the web search industry very early on uh, in a company that obviously didn't make it, where, look at, where we were struggling. When we hit 100,000 documents, that's going to be it. That's going to be, people won't, they just won't believe it. <laughs> you know, uh, the search capabilities are incredible and getting better. And this is something that we do together. This is a joint human pro project. So the old, uh, this is, I'm talking in huge terms now, but the biggest human project over the millennia in the West has been to build a body of knowledge. And we've defined knowledge in different ways and vet it, in, but that's, it's an intergenerational project, like building a cathedral in the old days, says the Jew. Uh, in which we are going to together discover, vet, authorize, and build upon what others before us have done. I mean, this is uh, the Newton. Go back to Newton. This in the introduction to his big big book. This he this, uh, stood on the shoulders of giants, and that was beautifully phrased. But it was also a very common thought. We were building a culture of knowledge, and just here's the contrast. Um, we did that by limiting and throwing out bad knowledge, sometimes good knowledge. And there, so that uh, that's a very worthwhile project. It does put tremendous power in the hands of the knowledge ruling class, which was white men and white men of particular economic class and the rest of it. All right, I mean, we can argue about that, but that's basically as true as any generalization gets. Um, so we paid a huge price as well. We all did, but especially people who are not white men. Um, and there's still lots of that type of knowing going on, and we're doing it building on what others know, but it's so fundamentally different because so much more is available. And the cultural project now is to make everything available that we possibly can and to build the mechanisms by which everybody gets access to everything else. Some of those mechanisms are cultural and important. Um, some of them are institutional, like fact-checking organizations and the rest. Um, but many of them have to do with a, a cultural change, which I think is very strongly generational and makes me really happy, um, moving away from trying to possess and own what you have created as a sole possession over which you have sole control, copyright, to doing things as, in, as openly as possible openly in terms of making it available on the internet and openly in terms of uh, making it easier for things to be reused both legally through things like Creative Commons, which make it easier to not violate, to use things without violating copyright and technically through things like application programming interfaces, which is where you left off, I think. <laughs> yeah, well done, well, well done, man. You know, it's it's one of nowadays. It's great because because I was going to pick up where where John Conway took off and uh, introduced the the great uh, game. I'll talk about that in a sec because I I, I found I, something came to me there when you were talking, and I, I was like, 
I read once that the more entropy that's in a brain, the more creative the person or the more chaos in a brain. So I often think of people who are neurodiverse or on the spectrum, they it's like a, it's like a waterbed effect, they they may lose some human con communication skills, but they think amazingly. And I, I thought about that, that when even you think back to Alan Turing, reading about Turing, it's clear that he was definitely on the spectrum. And, and he taught he taught differently, because the brain is different. You know, when you're neurodiverse, uh, it, it offers huge advantages. And I thought about how those those exemplars in our history were all the ones who made big leaps of change that changed the tools, therefore changing the thinking. And it took those people to be able to empower them and give them give them power to be able to make these decisions to change the world. But, but where I'm going with that is you're probably going, where the heck are you going? I, I'm going is you've worked in that industry from a very for a very long time. And I'd love your your view on this, this is not to do with the book, but what did you see? I mean, you see a world now where we're, we're way more aware of neurodiverse uh, di diversities, but we, but we it doesn't still mean we we're there. But we're aware, at least it's the first step. But what did you see in, in your in your experiences in the past? And you know, how oftentimes people were ostracized or often kept in their own box in a way to keep them away from messing with strategy or messing with predictability. Well, it, it's a interesting. I, I, it's an interesting idea. I have no idea if it's if it's right, because no, 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 I, I'm right. not saying it's right. Actually, I, I, it's just it just came to me that I wonder. It's a it's an I wonder. What if? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Um, it's again. I don't have evidence for this, but like you, I. I, I my intuition, which is almost always wrong, is that diversity in a culture certainly has this effect. I'm not sure how well that translates into diverse individuals. Um, I also throw out there that a surprising percentage of the major Western philosophers died virgins. I don't know what to make of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's put it into the AI, the machine learning. Let us figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hope not. Um, and I, you know, I've not done a careful study of this, but I have been struck by that. Um, or, or married, had very unhappy marriages, um, Socrates famously. On the other hand, there's a great deal of sexist um, based reading of uh, the life of philosophers, which finds philosophers' wives to be, um, oh, what's the right word? Uh, nasty baggage, you know, uh, Socrates famously, but we only have, we don't have, we don't have her side of the story. So, um, uh, anyway, um, diversity certainly, and I think there's a fair bit of evidence now that, um, diversity of viewpoint, uh, which often comes from diversity of experience, which also comes from often comes from diversity of race, culture, economics, and the like, and, and, um, sexual orientation, that sort of stuff, uh, is tremendously important. Um, and for, I think, I think the obvious reasons, which is that we get stuck in our way of thinking, we need somebody else to push us out of it. And um, more importantly for me, um, because my own interests is yet another indication that thought is not something we do in our heads, but we do out in the world with tools and we do with others. It's, it's not Newton standing alone on the shoulders of solitary giants, although he's, he, he, there's maybe never been a genius like him before. It's astounding. Um, that sentence probably doesn't make sense, but he, he's an astounding genius. Um, but this only happens in connected networks of people, not necessarily online, only recently online. But I think it's one of the important things about the internet is that it makes it clear how we are not fundamentally isolated and linked. We're fundamentally connected um, and capable of either withdrawing to some degree or viewing ourselves as withdrawn. Um, and that, that changes how at least I think about who I am. Yeah. Um, I am literally no one outside of my, as we now say, network of, of people. You know, starting with my family, but extending 
um, for example, to you, uh, you know, to everyone that I have I'm connected to or potentially connected to. Yeah. And the fact that we are now potentially connected to everyone, everyone is a couple clicks away, changes, I think, how we think about ourselves, even if we're not thinking about thinking about ourselves. Yeah. I'll, I'll I, give you a really simple, quick example. Um, at this point, it's uh, sort of an old man example. But when I was a lad, when you <laughs> left high school or college, you basically knew you were gonna, not going to keep up with your friends. And you may have told yourself you were going to, but you knew... Yeah, by the time I'm 70, I'm not going to have a lot of my college friends, even granting they're still alive. Um, and when you leave a job, everybody, you know, when you move cities, everybody says, oh, we'll keep in touch. And you don't. Yeah, you yeah. Can't. I mean, you're going to call your friends. Uh, I mean, you, twice a day, the way you used to run into them twice a day. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, with the Internet, as soon as address books, contact books, contact lists, whatever they are. Um, were invented, everybody's a click away. Everybody ever met. All right. I mean, that's why we don't use business cards anymore, except to make a sort of retro point. Um, and that, that changes. That changes everything. I can, you know, it, it, it changes how you think about who you are. If you're not keeping up, it's because uh, you chose not to. Perfectly reasonable. Can't keep up with everybody, especially that bastard from high school. You never <laughs> yeah, yeah. We all have one of those. Yeah. So I, I let, let's bring it back onto the narrative. Thanks for for uh, th thanks <laughs> for the narrative. Is that yeah. too much information? Try, try and bring no. Well, out. no. Well, I started it, man. So it's <laughs> it's my uh, my my flap of my butterfly wing. So uh, I brought us down an alleyway. Um, thank and thanks if anybody's still with us at this stage. Thanks for <laughs> remaining with us. Oh, um, so sorry. No, it's it's I, probably two chaotic uh, brains <laughs> having my, a chat. My publisher, who, who's uh, they're fantastic, a wonderful experience. It's uh, Harvard Business Press, and they're just incredibly helpful and patient and smart. Their wonderful PR person is probably turned off and after the Sally, few minutes, Sally, anger. Sally, yes. I didn't lead with the business implications. What's wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's true. I wish I had. She she said by the way about you, Sally. If it's Sally, oh, she said, yeah, said you're wonderful. She said uh, you love David. So well, just so you I know, that's Sally, so. you know you can tell your character by what people say behind your back, and that's what she said. So just so you know, um, okay, back to back to as linear as as life can be, right? Um, I, I I was going to pick up from in 1970s when uh, the distinguished professor in Prin Princeton, John Conway, invented that simple game because we went from the, the more controllable internet as it was, or computers, as, sorry, computers as it was, to a more started to kind of evolve a little bit at that stage. And it was that game that really was a moment in time that changed things. Yeah, um, because it was uh, a very important columnist, Martin Gardner, for uh, Scientific, Scientific American, huge readership wrote about it, and suddenly it, and it's such a great and powerful example. Um, John Conway died a few months ago, unfortunately, and apparently was uh, quite a character and much beloved. Rest in peace, man. Yeah. Um, so the he called it the game of life. Um, and the idea is really simple, which is actually the point. So you, you set up a, a grid of any size, an indefinite, infinite grid, scrolling grid, whatever it is. Um, and you randomly fill in some of the squares and say those are occupied squares. And then you have a series of turns. And at each turn, you apply four or five rules. Uh, I don't I won't get them right, but they are the sort of thing is the sort of thing that um, you look at the squares around any one square, right? So you got a square in the middle and it has eight squares around it. I don't know. I'm so bad at math. <laughs> I really should know this. Um, and if four or more are filled in, then you flip from occupied or blank or blank to occupied. But if fewer than three are filled in, then you always fill it in. So it's rules at that level of simplicity and it's four or five. Of them. And you keep, you do this um, uh, for all the squares in, in each turn. So you, each time you apply and then you have a new grid and you apply it again, you apply it again, you apply it again. Um, and so it sounds really pointless, except that it turns out that if you do this a lot, you do a sequence of them, you will discover some initial starting points 
right? Remember the importance of initial conditions, starting uh, initial state for um, chaos theory. You get some initial states um, where you filled in V squares and not those, where you apply the rules and you get um, repeating transformations over the course of, I don't know, 10 moves, it goes back to original state and cycles through. You get some in which the shape moves and turns into another shape. Um, and in some of the more spectacular examples, they do things that our human brains, if you animate them, look like, oh, there's spiders walking up, or you know, crude spiders walking up the, the page, or they are flapping their little wingy things and flying across the page, or they are shooting projectiles out of what seems to be their mouth. Here's the point. Um, if you want, so you're experimenting with this and you fill in some squares and you want to know, is this an interesting one in the way that I just described? Repeats or something like that. You literally cannot tell except by going through the repeated application of the rules. You cannot tell what it's going to look at stage three, or four, or a hundred or a thousand, except by doing that. You cannot, simple, simple rules. Oh my God, those rules are so simple. It's black and white on a grid. You don't get much simpler than that. And it's completely, A, it's completely unpredictable. And B, there's an order that emerges sometimes from some of those. People are still discovering interesting orders. Now, 40 years later, this is, it seems like just, a, he calls it a game, um, which sounds like it's trivializing it, but it's not because it's saying, here's a rule-based activity. This is a perfect, let's say, Newtonian rule, a world in which everything is ruled by knowable rules, incredibly simple rules. Um, and you can know, you can know the state of the entire little universe where all the filled in squares are on your grid. It's perfect. And you still can predict. You cannot predict one step beyond where you are. You can predict the next step by applying the rules, but you can't do the next step until you've done that. And so this just sort of, um, the implications of this are vast. It means we can generate a hugely complex universe from very simple rules, but it also means it is a universe that in most instances is going to be unpredictable, which is very contrary to our inclinations. There's a mathematical and polymath genius named Stephen Wolfram um, who, uh, who has a site called uh, Wolfram Alpha, which uses much of some of his work, who for the past 15 years has been applying um, this idea, basically Conway's idea, although I'm sure Wolfram would not want anyone referring to it that way, um, trying to apply the application of rules as simple as Conway's um, in order to uh, solve very real complex problems in fluid dynamics. Um, and now claims to have gener generated uh, basic Einsteinian physics, some of physics from it. So far beyond my understanding, but that's all I'll say. And I probably got that wrong as well. <laughs> so I, I thought we'd so that was this the start of this kind of wow this is what we can do and it, it started to blow it open a little bit so I'm going to jump a little bit here to machine learning and uh, you because you touched on this earlier on but I wanted to share one fascinating part and I absolutely love this um I read I read once about um a AI and, and robots picking coffee that it's a very, it has to be a very, very specific shade of green uh, to tell when it's ripe. And it's very difficult for LiDAR, the machine um, site, to actually see this. But you give a, a much better, much more fun example here. You say, until a chick is five or six weeks old, it's surprisingly difficult to tell the pullets from the cockerels or the boys from the girls if you're not in the trade. This is a problem if you're a commercial egg producer who sees males as nothing but a waste of chicken feed. And in the 1920s, the Japanese hit on a technique to address this. There are two ways to determine the sex of a chick. Check their wingtips and check their cloacaea, better known as buttholes. So you talk about this in the context of machines and machine learning. I'll hand it over to you now, man, to take it from here. Um, so. Chicken sexing, as it's known, you know, it's a somewhat <laughs> misleading name. 
um, disturbingly, disturbingly, <laughs> uh, was a problem in philosophy, in epistemology, because here was people could get trained and not be able to tell you how they know, but achieve 99% accuracy or, or more, I would, um, and not be able to tell you what they're seeing. And that doesn't fit with the Western epistemological, uh, Western philosophy's idea of how knowledge works, which should be you should be able to explain things. And if you can't, then generally we say, well, you don't really know it. I mean, good guess, but, but this isn't guessing empirically. It's not guessing. They're getting it right. Um, so it's um, very much an exception, right? we think, but it may not be as much of an exception as we think. Because there's uh, much of life, we know things that we can't fully explain. Um, I may say, oh, wow, you really... Oh, I can see it. You look, you look like your brother, even though I can't put my finger exactly why, but I might be able to pick you out as, yeah, no, I think that's the relative. Um, and much of life is like that. I mean, you talk about a chair to a child or to an adult and it's many in the same way, if I, in a lawyerly, philosophical lawyerly way, try to pin you down exactly what makes something a chair, I'm pretty confident that you don't know what a chair is. Neither do I, because I'm going to bring up examples where things are in between chairs. And is this really a chair? Is that really a chair? If I ask you to describe skip, you know how to skip, you know, yeah. down the street? Uh, Jump rope. Yeah. Uh, I think most of us do. If I ask you to describe skipping, define it in a way that somebody else could recognize it, I don't think you could. I've, I have asked this. I used to ask this of philosophy students in, in the 80s, and everybody knew what it was. And nobody could, could say exactly. I can't say exactly. I know what it is. So it may be that more of life is like, <laughs> this is going to make a terrible <laughs> I use this life, one. <laughs> I know what's coming, man. More of life is like chicken sexing. Then there like it is. Physics. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful uh, beautiful that's the line let's put that okay. roll the press put it oh on the God. cover weinberger yeah. said life's like chicken sexing <laughs> roll up roll up oh it's so immature yeah you know, i know I, sorry I know. man i, I brought yeah, the okay. tone I brought, so... <laughs> I brought the tone uh, no i know i walked right into it um knowingly uh machine learning can do things like that not necessarily in the same way. That is, there's one example, it was from a couple of years ago. And at that point, and um, machine learning systems were able to look at retinal scans and um, predict things about uh, the person's body that we didn't know were encoded somehow in those scans. And I won't get all these right, but it's things like, their elements of their heart condition and their gender and maybe their age. And both computer scientists and scientists looked at the scans and tried to, what is it seeing there? How, how is it, it's being right generally, you know, it's above chance by far that it's getting these things right. What is the tell? What are the hints? And they couldn't find it. And the machine learning system wasn't able to, wasn't able, forensic examination of the model also wouldn't tell them. Um, that's their implications to that about how much you want to trust them. Uh, the implications get worse when it's not a medical thing, um, but has something to do, say, with um, uh, the justice system or hiring or advancing people or grading student exams or all these sort of social things where we really want to know, was there bias in it? Is it make, you know, why is it, how is it doing it? Um, but it's doing this thing that seems like an analog to what we might call intuition, but I think it's actually much wider spread than that. It's my saying, oh, oh, you look like your brother or you look like your sister without my at least initially analyzing it, maybe not being able to tell you exactly why. I don't know. I think it's something about the eyes. I don't know. Um, more of our life may be like that. Now, that's not to say that the human brain works the way that the machine learning system does. That claim is often made. I am a skeptic, but I'm not a knowledgeable skeptic. So, Are, are you okay to go for another while? Sure. Yeah, we'll go for yeah. another little while. If, if anybody's listening, that is. <laughs> we, we may, I, I, I don't usually go this long, but there's so much in the book. And uh, 
I'd love to if you still have time. By the way, do you still have the the bottle of cream tartare? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used it since the book was written. Okay, we, we'll uh, I'll build on what what that's about. Maybe you'll explain that in a second. But <laughs> because here you explore the many ways we've taken advantage of digital networks over the past twenty years in order to escape from our age old pattern of dealing with the future by trying to outguess it. So we're coming towards strategy for those who have bared with us. Yeah, we should have started here. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, here you give the great example of Henry Ford, and many people see. Henry Ford is this amazing innovator, but he too became victim of disruption because he had a way of doing things. And when that got challenged, he couldn't let go of it. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, Ford seems to be back in the innovation game again um, with their electric pickup trucks. Um, yeah, and so the, I'm sorry, when I say we should have started with Ford, I meant I should have started with. No, Ford. that's good, man. Jeez. No, it's too late. Nobody's here. Why don't we just talk about our kids? Or I, I I couldn't possibly edit it and put it back in. The, where do no, I put no. this piece? Where do no, I put it's this? too late. It's too late just to say. Um, we'll keep going. We'll just keep it for ourselves and yeah. hand this down to our children. Um, <laughs> so in the book, the Ford serves a very useful for me purpose um, because the Model T is such a perfect example of a successful. Uh, design process for the time, which was 1908, eight or nine months in a locked room, 25 by 25, with a handful of engineers, and Ford knew what his market wanted, and he did, they designed it, and they didn't change it at all. Tiny changes for 19 years, and they sold 15 million of them. Um, so this is this is what people, you know, product designers and marketers used to dream of. Let's just nail it. Give the market what it wants, anticipate what the market wants and build it. And this, in fact, is a fantastic example of the more general uh, process that we've used for since Paleolithic times, which is to anticipate the future, in this case, what the market wants, and then prepare for it by building a factory that will churn out Model, model Ts. Um, and we, we rarely do it as successfully as Ford did, but this is the basis of Human hist most of human history, we've tried to do that one way or another, and we still do it, and we always will. But the internet, the, the shining examples on the internet are the opposite of this, and those shining examples are not the exceptions. They are just really good examples of how things get done on the internet generally. Um, uh, so it's actually an old set of examples because the minimum viable product started in the early 2000s. People still do it uh, for good reason. Uh, A-B testing is another sort of example. Um, with a minimum viable product like Dropbox or Slack or many, many others, you launch your product rather than trying to anticipate what everybody's going to need. You launch with the minimal thing that you think people will pay for. If it's Dropbox, you can work anywhere and you know seamlessly without having to, with the cloud, without having to worry about anything. Slack, you can communicate with other people. Keep it really simple and charge people for it and then see what people actually want. So rather than anticipating the other things they're going to want in this product, Watch, listen to them, watch, do metrics, see what they're using, what they're not, um, talk with them, listen to what people are saying on the internet to one another and build the thing that people actually want rather than you having to figure out what people want because you will not figure out what people want. Um, Dropbox is built up a really full, Zoom's doing this too, is built up a really full set of features. Slack also started off as a very simple messaging tool. Um, and both of those and many others also did this really useful thing, which was to open up their product so that other people could extend it or integrate it into their own systems. Um, Slack's a great example of this, uh, in part because they set up an $80 million fund to encourage people to build extensions to Slack. And they do this through a API, an application programming interface, doesn't matter, but it's a little piece of relatively simple, simple technology, which enables anybody on the web, generally without permission, to build on top of your system, to alter the way it works to suit their needs or their community's needs and the like, which means that you now have a product that meets actual needs and meets needs that were too niche for you to have invested in. Same thing, by the way, is, explains is a fundamental thing that drove the iPhone. iPhone had basically nothing that hadn't been in prior phones, other companies' phones, except for the App Store, which opened it up to anybody who wanted to turn this handheld computer into some other type of device, you know, for as a level for doing carpentry or, you, you know, the two million, literally two million other things that it does. 
That is so opposite from Henry Ford's approach and our traditional approach. Anticipate, build it, you own and control the product. Nothing goes in without you. There's no, you don't want anybody messing around with it. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours, branded, control it, it's yours. Turns out you get much more value out of it and a much better product if you minimize anticipation and make it possible for other people to turn your product into something, into something they need, not what you think they may need. And what the heck has that got to do with cream of tartare, man? <laughs> well, um, the cream of tartare industry is obviously uh, ripe for disruption. And about two thirds <laughs> of the book is about disrupting the cream of tartar business. <laughs> Uh, it shows up as an example early on is in an, in an analogy to how we stock our kitchens, right? Stocking a kitchen is anticipating what you're going to be cooking. And we do it. We're always going to do it. It's quite useful. But there, we ignore, therefore, the limitations of it, which is if you decide you come across a recipe for Indonesian something, something, and it has ingredients that you did not anticipate you're going to need, you are probably not going to be cooking Indonesian food that night. Assuming you're not in Indonesia, I'm assuming an Anglo-American cultural perspective here. Um, one of the things you do with this model of preparing, anticipating preparing, is that you over-prepare. So we've had the same bottle of prima tartar for multiple moves, multi multiple decades. Sorry. So we all do that, man. I think mine, <laughs> mine was, uh, I've done it with various types of teas and spices, and they just come with you, and you're like, on. Oh, I'll use it one day. What's the yeah, sure. what's the use by date? Oh, I got a I got till twenty thirty. So um, you you mentioned there. So I, I thought about the openness of this. So being able to connect and let others build upon what you've built. And you talk here, and I love this. The interop interoperability is the new causality. And you you accompany this with a lovely paragraph: protocol by protocol, standard by standard, app by app, system by system, and network by network. We have cre created a richly layered ecosystem of interoperability, each layer enabling new types of interactions. And I share that because it reminded me of a tech version of nature itself, where tech is the environment and we are the organism that adapts and evolves and creates to that environment because this interoperability is absolutely core. Now, Apple will tell you that's not the case, but it's interoperability between Apple products, which keeps you in that ecosystem, mm -hmm. but interoperability otherwise opens you up to a huge possibility. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Apple clearly is more closed than other systems, but within itself, as you say, it, the interoperability is crucial. And also, I mean, if you really couldn't open up uh, a pages, a, a numbers page, you know, the, the Macintosh version, it, um, it outputs uh, in Excel formats. It has to. Um, the thing about, so interoperability is the ability to use something from one system in another system, uh, quite possibly in a new, a new way the other person, the orig originators had not considered. This is at the core of the internet itself um, because we can link and go everywhere because the protocols make that make those pages and sites interoperable. Much of the data, the fact that uh, we can, I can send you a JPEG, et cetera. Um, so much of the internet is enabled by interoperability, but we've also taken it to another level with things like APIs, which enable people to write programs that dynamically use data from another system um, in some unexpected way, maybe combine it with other things, whether it's, I don't know, it's um, uh, reviews from a retail sites that have been made interoperable, which get combined with a rating system here and product listings there or whatever. It's a terrible example. But, um, we do this all the time on the internet. We do it with ideas and content, thanks to um, things like Creative Commons, which make it easier to share content without having to ask permission. Um, and that it explains, without that, the internet's dead. It's just a repository of silos um, and without any real ability to build on itself. The difference from, so you're exactly right, it's like nature in its, um, the interconnection of all the piece, pieces, but it's like, uh, but it's more than that. In many ways, it's less, of course, because it doesn't smell good, for example. You can't walk through it. Um, but it's 
better than it in its, our ability to reuse pieces. Now, we reuse pieces of nature all the time. We use uh, wood for lumber and for firewood and et cetera, et cetera. We do so at cost of the tree, whereas on the internet, you don't use things up. You just reuse them, which is pretty amazing. Um, but we're also freer because it's a programmatic world. We can program things to be different, to do different things, and to make those things that we now make also output interoperable products and to be interoperable themselves, it's a much, it's a, I don't know what to say. I don't want to say it's more complex than nature, but it's a more open, pliable world. And the, the fundamental point of, uh, of, um, of everyday chaos in one way is we've gone from thinking about the future in terms of how we can narrow it to the thing that we want to thinking about the future in the age of the internet and also machine learning. Uh, in terms of how can we open it up to get what we want and to get things we didn't know we or anybody else wanted? How can we make more and more possibility rather than limiting it? And I think that's exactly where we are. And companies that try to limit possibilities are limiting their own possibilities. Companies that open up, take what they're making, which they want to, by instinct, just want to hold on to and keep their own. Opening that up as far as possible enables uh, viral events to happen, enable their work to be integrated with uh, in new ways and to meet needs they could not have anticipated, enable their work to be integrated into workflows and become a normal part of life. And Slack is a spectacular example of this. Um, they allow the entire internet, which is say at this point, just about, let's just say the entire world eventually, to add value to their product by adding features, using it in new ways, exposing it to more people. It's exactly the opposite of the old mindset of thinking about the future in terms of control, narrowing possibilities, narrowing information, and trying to get the, hit the one thing we hope that will lead to success. Beautiful. That's a, I think that's a wonderful way to wrap it up, David. I, I absolutely loved our conversation, obviously. And I just want to remind our audience that we have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter to be in with a chance of winning a copy of Everyday Chaos. David, where can people find out more about you and your work, your writing, et cetera? I really, I'll tell you, I really don't think anybody at this point wants to do that. They um, will, but, man. They will. <laughs> well, if they got through to this point, it's either to write me hate mail or because <laughs> um, hate mail you can send to go screw yourself at hatemail.com. <laughs> hey, that's my email address. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I hope you've been enjoying my, my hate mail. I've been sending stuff there for a long time. Um, Weinberger.org is the basic homepage. Um, I would recommend clicking on that on the writings page to get a sense of what I'm actually doing or weinberger.org slash writings or for the book in particular, everydaychaosbook.com. Author of Everyday Chaos, Technology, Complexity, and How We're Thriving in a New World of Possibility, David Weinberger. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, man.